Uh, can everyone, can you hear me okay there? Yes, we can. Okay. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, this represents the results from a Comet Partners project that Phil Schumacher and I worked on uh, for several years now. And so Phil is from Sioux Falls, the science officer there for many years, and I am associate professor of meteorology at Central Michigan University. So we'll be discussing uh, some research we've done and looking at uh, single bands of snowfall in the central U.S. So we both kind of looked at uh, the climatology and some composites uh, of the fields associated with these types of events. So there's been a lot of previous work done uh, in the northeast U.S., but uh, less so in the central U.S. Uh, so Novak's 2004 WAF paper uh, really documented well the uh, climatology of banding there of many types of bands as well as some composites uh, associated uh, with those bands. Uh, there's been some studies that have shown that a banding can occur in the northeast quadrant of the cyclone. In Novak's northeast storms he found that uh, banding did occur in the northeast quadrant uh, but was less common uh, than the northwest quadrant. So by northeast quadrant, we're just dividing the low into four different quadrants where this is the northwest and this would be the northeast here. Uh, in an AMS preprint from 2003, uh, Peter Banikos from Vermont uh, highlighted the uh, conditions that would be associated with the northeast quadrant band here, uh, associated with highly confluent flow at 700 millibars. Uh, but this was just associated with a couple of cases. So I'm sure that as forecasters in the central U.S., you've seen these northeast quadrant bands, but no one has really looked at how prevalent they are uh, and what conditions are associated with them. So we all have experienced forecasting for banded snowfall. So Phil cooked up this nice little hypothetical uh, event where uh, there was a slight shift in the axis of the band and a slight increase in the intensity of the band. But just take a look at if you were forecasting for Sioux Falls, you predict 10 inches here on the left-hand side, uh, and what really happens is 3 inches here on the right-hand side. So uh, tough forecast problem. And uh, if we know something about the distribution of events uh, that uh, are associated with this uh, forecast challenge, uh, then hopefully we'll have better situational awareness for what might be coming in new forecasted events. So we had several questions and we were able to answer them to the greater or lesser degrees. Uh, so how often do we see northeast quadrant bands compared with northwest quadrant bands? Do we see a similar distribution as we do in the northeast U.S. with predominantly northwest quadrant banding? Do the bands have a common statistical distribution and evolution? Is there something that we could capture in maybe the sort of more now cast mode uh, that when we see the band starting to change in a certain way that means they're increasing in intensity or decreasing? How do moisture lift and instability organize to generate these bands? Uh, do we see the same sort of things that we see in northeast quadrant bands that are known to be associated with northwest quadrant bands? How do the banding environments organize when the flow regime is from the northwest or, or southwest? So in the northeast U.S., we have a predominant storm track, uh, whereas we have two different flow regimes, the more clipper-type storms uh, versus the more sort of digging troughs that we see with the southwest-oriented flow. So how did banded environments differ? Um, how does the environment differ if we have bands versus non-bands? Because we know that we can get a lot of warm air advection type snow in the central U.S. that can produce a significant amount of snowfall, uh, but not associated with banding. So uh, we had a, an established set of criteria to find what was a band or what wasn't a band. So we first started with uh, co-op data, 12Z to 12Z, and looked for snowfall swaths greater than 4 inches. So that's what we used as uh, an event, and that's similar to uh, criteria that other studies have used, and it's also close to snow advisory criteria in the central U.S. for many locations. We looked for five years uh, to find these events uh, using compositive half-degree radar data uh, over the CONUS, and I'll show an example of what this looks like here in the next couple slides. So the winners that we looked at were 2006, 06, 07 through 10, 11. Uh, 
we recorded the length and width of the bands every 30 minutes, so that allows us to sort of statistically look at uh, how the bands changed and what your average band looks like, uh, which hasn't been done a lot before. And to define northwest or southwest flow, we just looked at the movement of the 500 millibar vorticity maximum. So a band was defined as 25 dBZ or greater reflectivity. Uh, Novak, for his northeast U.S. bands, used 30 dBZ. So we used a slightly lower threshold. Uh, radars are maybe spaced farther apart in the central U.S. and, and also might just have a little bit less moisture to work with uh, to give us those higher totals of, of reflectivities. The band had to be 250 kilometers in width and lasting for two hours or more uh, for it to make our uh, data set and it had to be located in an area where snowfall was observed so we didn't look at bands that were associated with other precipitation types so we, we supplemented our analysis with additional data to make that decision. We received the locations of the fronts and the lows from WPC from their three hourly surface analysis and the, the resolution of that pinpoints the location of the cyclone center uh, to the nearest one degree. So to do this analysis, I had to develop a special tool, web tool, that used the Open Layers API uh, that allowed us to bring in the, uh, the reflectivities and also measure and put in the WPC analysis. So this shows an example of that. Uh, there is a new tool from NCEI that allows you to look at this same composited radar. It doesn't have the, the frontal analyses and low pressure with it, uh, but you might want to check that out if you're not familiar with it because it does feature the same composited, composited uh, radar that was collected by Iowa State and it has a measuring tool as well. So this is an example of a northeast quadrant band that was very lengthy, almost 800 kilometers in length and quite narrow in width. So three more examples of bands. The top there, the classic northeast band, uh, and then on the right, uh, traditional northwest band, and then uh, on the bottom, what we would call a both band. Or so the, it spent the majority of its time in both northeast and northwest quadrants. If a band was in a diff different quadrant, uh, southwest or southeast, we didn't include that. We don't really see uh, many snowfall features associated with banding in those quadrants anyway. So there were a total of 104 events, or 104 cyclones, and 38 of these 104 events were non-banded, so 40 percent. Uh, 66 events were associated with banding, so most uh, cyclones that produced 4 inch greater snowfall were associated with bands. Uh, for Dave Novak's study in the northeast U.S., uh, only 15 percent of his events were non-banded, so that suggests that maybe banding is a little bit uh, more common in the northeast U.S. than in the central U.S. Of these 66 events, we saw 98 bands because some cyclones produce multiple bands either in the same quadrant or within different quadrants at different times. 55% uh, of these 98 were in the northeast quadrant, 30% uh, were in the northwest quadrant, and 15% were in both quadrants. Uh, so notice that almost twice as many northeast quadrant bands versus northwest quadrant bands. So that suggests that uh, in contrast to the northeast U.S., uh, northeast quadrant bands are uh, more common than northwest quadrant bands based upon our five-year sample. So Dave Novak's study, only 19 percent of his bands were northeast quadrant. So this suggests that uh, the frequency of banding in the northeast quadrant is significantly higher in the central U.S. versus the northeast U.S. So here's where the bands were and also classifying it by uh, the northeast bands are in red here, or northwest, uh, northeastern blue, and both bands are in green. So we have fairly good distribution of banding. This also goes to show our domain uh, approximately east of the Rockies. Uh, to just west of the Appalachians, up to the Canadian border, and down to the Gulf Coast. Uh, so if a band spent most of its time outside of this domain, it was not included in the sample. This next one shows the cyclone locations that are associated with those bands, and you can see uh, these are the different kinds of bands where the cyclone was associated with each kind, and also including the non-banded uh, events here where their cyclones were located. So again, covers much of the, the domain um, one thing that you might notice is that there are more northwest quadrant bands 
here in the southeast U.S., uh, and that's probably just due to uh, the restrictions that we placed on our domain. So how many bands do we find in each category? So notice here the flow regimes, northwest or southwest, and then the uh, snow location, northeast band, northwest band, or both band. Uh, so the composites I'm going to show later on are these with the higher numbers here. So we see that most of the bands were in southwest flow versus the northwest flow. Again, most northeast bands versus uh, northwest bands. Uh, northwest band and northwest flow is uncommon. We only found a couple of those. and That could just be due to the fact that if you've got your low coming down from the northwest, uh, it's typically moving more quickly and you're less likely to get the warm conveyor belt uh, air moving all the way around the low like that. Uh, there's been some previous work that suggests that the uh, strength and direction and characteristics of the upper level flow can really affect uh, the types and locations of frontogenesis that you get. So we, that was borne out in our study as well. So again, 98 total bands uh, that we looked at uh, throughout the five year period. So next, the non-banded events. Again, fewer of them, but still significant. Uh, remember that each one of these events was associated with uh, four inch or greater snowfall. So it still was you know, significant snowfall. Uh, so the composites that we're going to show are just for southwest flow, 25 events, northwest flow, 13 events. So we didn't, and the composites discriminate based upon snow location. Here are the band locations relative to the surface low, and these are snapshots at the approximate midpoint uh, of the life cycle of the band. So here are the northwest rock quadrant bands, the northeast quadrant bands, and the bands in both quadrants. So uh, it's still a judgment call, but you can see from this that uh, there are pretty clear distinctions between uh, what band goes in each one of these three categories. And then from this, you know, this plot shows the center point here is the location of the low. And then the band is plotted at its uh, location relative to that low uh, on this polar plots. So the average distance from the low, uh, just summing over all of these bands, and this is for the center point of the band. Uh, in our analysis, our data collection, we looked at the center and the left and the right point of the band there. So this is for the center point here. Uh, the mean distance from the low, notice the northeast bands were the furthest away and also had the greatest variability in their distance away from the low. But the both bands closer in and the northwest bands kind of in between the northeast and both bands. Uh, so more than 50 percent of the northeast bands are greater than 600 kilometers away. So I'll notice some of these that are, are very far away, whereas most of the, the northwest band, 66%, were less than 600 kilometers away, and 87% of the both bands were less than 600 kilometers away. So this suggests that there are some differences in where the bands set up in relation to the low, depending upon what quadrant the band forms in. So as I said, we're going to look at the sort of average and, and median conditions or uh, characteristics of, of the bands uh, that we collected. So these statistics are averaged over the band's duration. So of these, almost nearly 100 bands uh, looked at collectively, uh, the median band is about 400 kilometers, about 40 kilometers in width, has an aspect ratio of 10 to 1 and lasts for about four hours. And you can see that the means are a little bit different. The distributions are positively skewed, as we'll see in the next slide. And that's due to the fact that we had some really long bands, uh, some bands that lasted for a really long time. And also, we set lo lower boundaries on these uh, length and width uh, and duration to define what is a band. An interesting thing that we'll see once again in the next slide, but the medians and the means don't vary by more than 15 percent. Uh, from these values for all categories of band. Uh, so we can see the distributions here uh, stratified by, uh, here's the width, length, aspect ratio in time for the northeast, northwest, and then all the bands here. Uh, so notice that there are, there's some pretty significant variability 
when you look at width here going from 80 to 30 kilometers and especially the length for these northeast bands as we saw in the polar plot greater than 600 to just above 300. Uh, but what you see is that the, the medians which are these uh, dashed lines here, the mean is the box, but the medians don't really vary uh, depending no matter what type of band you're looking at. Okay, so what this result suggests is that the common appearance exists for all bands no matter what flow regime they're in and no matter where they are with respect to the surface load. So there's a lot of variability, but when you're talking about the average or the median band, uh, a band is a band is a band, uh, no matter where it is. And that uh, reflects the fact that the dynamics uh, that produce the bands are similar, as we'll see in the composites, no matter where the band is located uh, with respect to the cyclone or uh, no matter what type of flow regime that it is in. So I wanted to translate this sort of statistical plot into something that is uh, maybe more useful uh, in terms of forecasting. So I plotted a hypothetical band at a hypothetical location. And this band is the uh, median band. And we looked at the uh, length and width, how it evolves from sort of when we first identified it as a band uh, to when it uh, was no longer met our criteria and then uh, how did it change from sort of beginning to midpoint and midpoint to end. So notice that the length it gets longer and then the length reduces. The width stays about the same and then it reduces. So we can see that in the, the shape of the band here. And so there is something to uh, some sort of characteristic band evolution, at least especially in terms of the length of the bands. And then we can see the variability here in the next slide. So there is some variability here. So what's plotted here is the distribution of percent changes in snow band characteristics. So I'm just evaluating um, over the first half of the band, how did its width change? And then over the second half of the band, how did its width change? So the, it's a percentage change in the width. So notice that uh, the biggest signal is in terms of the length. So what this result is showing is that for the median band, it increases by 15% in its length over the first half of its life. And then for the second half of its life, it decreases by 10%. And what you see is with these box plots, Notice there, the boxes are, are cleanly separated. So that suggests that this is a statistically significant result, that most of the bands are doing this during their life cycle, getting longer and then getting shorter. Uh, so that's something that I think uh, we might watch for in terms of looking at the radar. Is this event still getting stronger, uh, or is the band at the second point of its life cycle uh, where it's going to be diminishing in, in strength? Uh, the thing that we haven't looked at here is how is the intensity changing uh, as we go across you know, the length and the width changing uh, from the beginning to the midpoint and the midpoint to the end. So moving on to sort of the second half of the talk, uh, looking at the composites for the uh, different bands that had more events. So how do we create the composites? We use the NAR data set, North American Regional Reanalysis, uh, 32 kilometers in space and three hours in time. Uh, we made composites uh, by putting a box centered on each surface low. Uh, so we chose the surface low rather than the band location. The composites that I'll show are displayed with the center point being the average of all cyclone locations in the cate category. So it's again centered upon the surface low. When a cyclone features multiple bands at different times, each band was included in the composite. Uh, if a cyclone disappeared from the analysis, we didn't use that in the composites, but what I'm only going to show you here are the composites where t equals zero, uh, the three hourly time closest to band onset. So here's what we're going to look at, uh, five different composites, uh, northwest band and, and southwest flow, that's what my annotation is here. Uh, again, only t equals zero will be shown. We'll also look at two composites that have no banding, both in southwest and northwest flow. Uh, so the southwest flow has bands in both quadrants. Remember, the northwest flow only has bands in the northeast quadrant, as we only found two cases that had uh, bands in the northwest flow in the northwest quadrant. So I'm going to show uh, these five different composites, and all the, the maps are going to have the same things plotted. Uh, so what you see here, 500 millibar heights in the black, 
I mean sea level pressure in the red, 300 ice attacks in the image on our left hand side here. Uh, also note the yellow line here is where we're going to show a composite cross section and the black line is the average band location. So you can see this is a northwest band here in the northwest quadrant within southwest flow with the low lifting off like this. Uh, on the right hand side we've got 700 millibar heights, 550 to 650 ES saturated equivalent potential vorticity to assess the instability, uh, and then 650 to 750 millibar frontogenesis. So notice the instability is commonly located above the frontogenetical circulation uh, in the middle of the, the where the air is rising and being forced most vigorously upward by the frontogenesis. So what we see here is that the low is in the left exit region of this jet streak here and you've got another strong jet to the north. Uh, we have a fairly strong neutrally tilted trough here that's beginning to lift out of the southwest. On the right hand side we see uh, frontogenesis here associated with the band and then you see EPV zero right through here. So you've got your warm conveyor belt air streaming up and being lifted uh, by the mesoscale frontogenesis. So the band is there on the uh, warm side of that frontogenesis where we would expect it to be. So that cross section here southeast to northwest, the air is flowing up like this and being lifted. Uh, there's your max omega there uh, riding up and over the maximum compositive frontogenesis. So this is 27 cases. You see uh, RH with respect to ice here. So yes, omega is in black. Frontogenesis is in the image. Uh, SEPV is in the blue. RH with respect to ice is in the green. So notice that you see a lot of frontogenesis here in the low levels. Uh, and that's, some of that is associated with the smearing associated with the compositing where you've got very strong frontogenesis uh, different points in the low levels. The location of the compositive band is this black bar right here, so directly underneath the lift. Uh, so this northwest band and southwest flow, these sorts of events have been studied uh, for a long time, uh, so this shows us uh, just what we expect to see, uh, what we've learned about in the past with these types of events. Northeast band in southwest flow, uh, 37 cases, so notice that your band here right there uh, in the northeast quadrant of the low. Um, same fields once again. So what we see is the same organization of moisture lift and instability uh, as we saw with the northwest band, but it's just in a different location out ahead of the low. Uh, so if you look at um, 500, you see it's a little bit of a less amplified solution. So your downstream ridge here is flat, the zonal flow. We can go back just a couple slides. We see the northwest flow events, the band is, or the downstream ridge is a little bit more amplified. Uh, so taking a look at the frontogenesis, we do see some northwest quadrant frontogenesis, but it's, it's uh, not in that sort of linear shape that we know is to be associated with banded snowfall, uh, which we do see here northeast of the surface low. Notice the 700 millibar flow here is more confluent. Uh, looks like what Pete Banikos had identified, so uh, this bears out his hunch, uh, or the events that he saw, that they are in fact common in the central U.S. Here's the cross-section here, going from southwest to northeast this time. Here's your reduction in uh, equivalent potential vorticity. Here's the location of the band. Notice your vertical motion is quite a bit weaker. Your RH is weaker a little bit here. Uh, suggests that there's likely a little bit more variability in the band location uh, in contrast with our northwest oriented bands. Uh, but nevertheless, we do see the signals here that we expect to see in association with precipitation banding. Moving on to the events in southwest flow that feature no banding, uh, recall these are still associated with events that had greater than four inches of snowfall. Uh, just that that snowfall was not banded. So we do see a, a, a solution in the 500 millibar heights that's slightly more amplified compared with uh, the 500 heights in, in both banded cases we've looked at before. But notice your jet streaks are maybe a little bit more distant, especially this northern stream jet streak uh, further away from the uh, low in, the, in any precipitation uh, and less likely to uh, have any jet coupling through here. Notice the frontogenesis, there is some, but it's 
pretty far distant from the low and weaker in magnitude. And your stability, here's your zero line of stability. It's farther away, and definitely uh, much farther south uh, from the band and the precipitation than we'd seen in the previous uh, slides. So there are some signals here that suggest that, yes, precipitation is occurring, but there's very little to suggest that that precipitation is in the form of, of a band. So if you look at the uh, cross-section here, so you do see frontogenesis, uh, but your low values of SEPV are, are, are distant or non-existent away from this frontogenesis. You do see this area of vertical motion through here, uh, somewhat weaker and more diffuse. And so the moisture is also you know, greater than 85 or to 90 here. So you're getting production of snowfall, but you're not getting banding because you don't have the instability and your frontogenesis signal is uh, present, but not as strong and not as coherent as what we see in the events associated with banding. Moving on to northeast bands and northwest flow. Uh, so we see a, quite a different pattern here. Your low is coming down like this. Uh, from the northwest, and this is on the southern edge of the sort of true clipper type system uh, that John Martin of Wisconsin has done some work on uh, showing composites associated with those. Sort of a weak trough embedded in uh, fast moving zonal flow here. Uh, notice this weak wave is embedded in a much stronger jet than what we'd seen uh, associated with the southwest flow composites, suggesting that you've got a much stronger temperature gradient here in the column and that stronger temperature gradient is associated with strong, very coherent signal for frontogenesis there, uh, stronger than what we'd seen in the uh, other composites likely associated with that fairly strong jet. Uh, so this is what we see northeast quadrant bands and northwest flow. Notice you've got your instability uh, just to the south, the air flowing up uh, and toward that long axis of frontogenesis uh, associated with the banding. So. Taking a look at the cross-section again, we're seeing our ingredients that we know to be associated with abandoned snowfall uh, just oriented in the northeast quadrant and with a different northwest flow regime here. So we see a strong signal for frontogenesis. You see a vertical motion here. This is RH with respects to ice greater than 90% uh, for the 17 cases in this category. You see the instability uh, moving, here's zero, moving toward that uh, lift associated with frontogenesis and here you see the lift is right over the band. So slightly more stable air here compared with the previous banded composites but notice here frontogenesis is a little bit stronger and it's a little bit more coherent in the vertical. Next, northwest flow but no banding. Uh, only 13 cases here. Uh, so what we see is that um, there is a weaker low here, only 1016, a uh, much weaker jet here, maybe a slightly stronger trough, uh, little to no frontogenesis, and your instability is once again confined to points much farther to the south. So some similarities in this composite with the no band composite in southwest flow. The ingredients just aren't there, although there are some indications that we have uh, moisture lift and instability that favors snowfall that's not banded. So in the cross-section, any instability you have is, is kind of way up here. So here's 0.1 and less, and notice it's up around five or 600 millibars, whereas your frontogenesis is confined to points lower than 800 millibars. So you're not getting that nice juxtaposition that we like to see uh, to produce banding. So I just put each one of them here and to show us the summary that we can compare so all these up here are the southwest flow, all these down here are the northwest flow, on the right are the ones associated with no banding. Okay, so notice that uh, the jet streaks are stronger here right, uh, to the north and south of low than they are with the, the no banded event. And the jet streak is much more prominent with the northwest flow northeast band. Uh, where compared with both the southwest flow banding and the northwest flow with no band. So there are some subtle but significant differences uh, amongst each one of these different composites that we can use for pattern recognition to match uh, within different NWP output, particularly within uh, ensembles. We could see maybe uh, 
which ensembles are matching these patterns, for example. And then looking at the lift and stability, again, with the banded events, strong frontogenesis, in all three cases, very strong frontogenesis with the northwest flow, northeast band, and then limited frontogenesis with your instability much farther to the south, in both cases without banding. And so in the cases with bands, we're seeing moisture lift and instability organized in the same way, just with different locations relative to the cyclone and within different flow regimes. So that's kind of a major result uh, of this work. And the cross sections, uh, I will kind of skip over, but again, you notice the very strong, prominent frontogenesis and the reduction of, insta of stability uh, in the region of saturation and lift with the bands and the lack of all those things with no bands. So one of the things that's good to do when you're working with cross section or with composites is evaluate just how representative the composites are of uh, each individual event. So you can average any field you want and you would come up with a composite, but it would be not very meaningful if the composites don't somewhat reflect the events that comprise it. So uh, we did linear spatial correlations, so just it's a way of assessing how well the fields match in space in terms of their patterns and less so of their magnitudes. Uh, so this is going to evaluate the extent to which the composites represent the individual events that comprise them. So. Uh, the best correlation you can get is one, um, and what we're seeing here is different fields, the same ones that we'd looked at in our composites, right, that we see 500 heights, 700 heights, our EPV field, our ice attacks, our RH, our MSLP, and our frontogenesis at the different levels uh, that we'd focused upon. Uh, so notice that these are distributions, so these box plots show the correlations for all the events, and this is for all categories uh, that we examined for banding. So notice that the height fields, all of them match fairly well, and some of that is due to just the climatological vari variation. These fields are sort of intermediate, 0.5 to 0.7, uh, still fairly good. Uh, MSLP, there's a lot more variation, although the correlation is around 0.5 to the median and median. Uh, so that's pretty good, but we know that the ingredients can organize even when we have a weak cyclone, so we expect to see a lot of variability there. Uh, with 700 millibar frontogenesis, that's where we start to see really low correlations. There are a variety of reasons for that. Uh, derived fields tend to have more variability. It's a mesoscale field. Uh, the altitude of maximum frontogenesis might vary in event by event, uh, so we expect to see that this has a uh, lower Relate, the individual events are, are more variable compared with the average composite event. Uh, so we consider this to be a pretty good result, uh, one that we would expect, and you should expect in this instance that the composite looks like the events because we sort of prescribed the events that were going into each composite by saying, well, we know we've got banding, we know where the banding is, and we know what kind of flow regime we're dealing with. So you should expect that these events, the fields come out somewhat similar. Uh, so this next slide shows those same correlations for all the different categories we looked at. Uh, no bands here, uh, northeast and northwest bands here. So what this suggests is that uh, it doesn't matter uh, which composite you're looking at, it was all roughly representative, similarly representative uh, of the events that comprised it. So there's there's no differences there where one composite uh, is less useful or is less representative of the events that comprise it. So we consider that to be a, a good result as well. We wanted to look a little bit more into this frontogenesis uh, low correlation that you see in each one of these uh, different types of, of events. So we did that just looking at a couple of case studies. So we took an event where the frontogenesis, you can see in the inset here, where the band is much closer to the low. So you might expect that that frontogenesis would be lower down in the atmosphere. And you can see in this particular event, it, it wasn't. It was very deep and strong frontogenesis here. And this is where the band is located. So you compare that with another event that you know, the dynamics here, the large scale fields look fairly similar, similar that you can see in the left. Only this band was distant uh, from the low and from the implied warm sector. So you might expect the frontogenesis higher up here. Well, it turns out it's not. 
and here's the vertical motion in front of Genesis associated with that band, and it's in fact lower down. It's kind of the opposite of what we might expect. So what this just goes to show is that there is indeed a lot of variability uh, in the location and strength of that front of Genesis uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, it's more variable than what we see in the other fields there. So there's more work to be done to just to assess uh, and characterize the variability that we see in front of Genesis with different types of events within each composite category. So since these northeast bands haven't been looked at as much, uh, based upon the quantitative composites, I made some conceptual models that can kind of serve as, as reference points. Uh, so this is northeast band and southwest flow. Uh, here's your low, here are your jet axes, your 700 millibar trough axis, uh, 700 height line. Um, here's where you see the max for anagenesis. In purple here is the band, and then there's your zero line for SEPB. Uh, so this is just mimicking and uh, simplifying what we see in the previous composites. Uh, so notice that confluent flow right through here seems to be uh, something that's strongly associated with banding in production of frontogenesis. Next, northeast band and northwest flow. Uh, there you see the 700 millibar trough axis in your jet uh, like this. Uh, and here's your implied low and your SEPV and your frontogenesis and your band in between the two. So reflection of, of what the composite showed us. So in conclusion, there's nearly twice as many northeast quadrant bands and northwest quadrant bands in the central U.S. based on this uh, five-year sample. More banding in, north, in southwest flow than northwest flow. These northwest quadrant bands and northwest flow appear to be very uncommon. The statistics on the band, so we can now say what does an average band look like in the central U.S. based on a five-year sample. It lasts four hours, it's about 40 kilometers wide, and it's about 400 kilometers long. During the first half of the band's life, it gets longer, the width stays the same. In the second half, both the length and the width contract. So it's somewhat subtle, but the statistics do bear out that especially the change in length here uh, is something that we see quite often. The juxtaposition of the ingredients known to be associated with banded snowfall are similar no matter where they set up uh, in terms of quadrant and flow regime. Uh, the robust composites that we evaluated via the linear spatial correlation allow forecasters to find patterns in NWP and therefore diagnose regions favorable for banded snow. Now, though, we have convective allowing models where we can just look at it and see, is there a band there? Uh, so not much research has been done to really validate the capabilities of these convective allowing models. So it's right now, I think, a good idea to see uh, if a cam is producing a band, is it associated with the features uh, that we know to be associated with band and snowfall on a larger scale, uh, which we've uh, shown here today? So that does beg the question, how good are these cams? Because you know, that's, that's where we're at. Um, fortunately, we have a new project, a Sea Star project, between central and eastern region both, entitled Prediction of Heavy Banded Snowfall, Resolution Requirements, Microphysical Sensitivity, and Hydrometeor Lofting that just started back in May between myself, NC State, uh, with Gary Lackman, Phil at Sioux Falls, and Mike Evans at Binghamton. So the CAMs are showing banded signatures for sure. Uh, how good are they? Uh, how much variability is there in event by event? Uh, how far in advance can they predict uh, versus the uh, models that we've always had available? So these are questions we hope to answer. And then with these uh, CAMs, they're going to resolve a, a much more realistic, uh, higher magnitude updraft. And so you get into the details of the microphysics. With the higher updraft, the stronger updraft, is, is it's spilling the snow out where it should be. Uh, so you deal get into things like the microphysics parameterization of the, the snowfall terminal velocity. Uh, if this isn't right, then the band is not going to occur in the correct spot. Uh, so we plan to evaluate things like this. Are there uh, additional fields associated with the microphysics that we could output from these CAMs that might give us a better idea of how uh, the evolution of the banding and why the band is evolving as it is within the model? So we'd like to thank the Comet Partners Program and, and hope that more funding would go to it to support these kinds of studies. Chuck Graves from St. Louis University provided the composite code. Uh, Daryl Herzman at Iowa State gave us the radar imagery. Uh, Dave Novak in his uh, science branch at the time gave us the uh, coded funnel bulletins. Here's how you could get a hold of Phil and I. And right now we have a 
uh, paper that's uh, accepted to WAF pending major revision, so you should be able to read all about this sometime uh, in early 2017. So uh, thank you, and at this point, uh, if Bill is there, I'd like to add anything, questions at this time. I'm going to unmute everybody, so hopefully um, we won't have too much background noise. So if you haven't, please make sure your uh, phone is on mute. And then if you have questions, you can probably go ahead and speak up. I don't know. I don't see that all. If I hear background noise, I'm probably going to... I called him off. earlier. Uh, so, do we have I questions see. for Marty? Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get everybody unmuted, so... Um, okay. I know it's a lot of information in a short amount of time. You can also um, chat or um, um, ask a question. Hey, this is John in North Black. Can you hear me yet? Yes, we can. Okay, hey. Um, uh, great presentation, Marty. Thanks very much. Um, Thank you. Really liked your presentation there. I'm just curious. One of the questions that came up here is: Did you find um, maybe some uh, much heavier snowfall amounts in either the northeast band versus northwest band cases? We haven't looked at that at all. Patients. Uh, my guess is that probably the northwest events have more uh, snowfall, but uh, you might know more about that than our, I would from your own experience. That data, we do have it, so it's something that we could look at and answer. Okay. Uh, another question I have is um, you, you identified the areas of uh, saturated EPV there. Did you um, characterize the, the type of instability, in other words, um, whether CI versus more of a CSI type of uh, event occurred in, in one versus the other? No, we didn't do that. Um, that's an important question as well that could be answered uh, that will tell us a little bit more about the dynamics and the variability in these events. Uh, but given our objectives of kind of looking at large-scale fields, uh, we stayed away from that because it, there's still quite a bit of debate about what's happening there and I don't know that our data would really show uh, definitively what was going on especially there's a, a probably a lot of evolution that's going on uh, between you know upright versus slant wise uh, that we wouldn't be able to capture so it's been there but we didn't we didn't look at it gotcha okay thanks I appreciate it very much thank you Are there any other uh, questions for Marty? Um, we did have a comment on uh, um, from uh, Chicago. It says nice work, Marty and Phil. So uh, kudos to Chicago. You. They must have gotten up early enough to, uh, after the World Series <laughs> last night, to yes. pay attention. <laughs> um, anyone else? All right, well, thank you, Marty uh, and Phil. Um, thank you all for joining. And feel free to get a hold of me if you have any ideas about this work or new directions we could take or projects we could work on together.
right. Sounds good. And there will be a recording of this that we will share out um, a little bit later. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.